and today I'm honored and I'm sharing the same camera with the well-decorated professor at the University of Zimbabwe in the legal field, as well as the whole non-political guru, Professor Maduku Holcomb. Thank you very much. You're welcome, yeah. Uh, all right. Professor, uh, to start, let's take you back in early 80s where you've been a student at the University of Zimbabwe. And in terms of uh, the status quo and the environment, all to do with politics and education. Well, I think that uh, if you take us back to the 1980s, I, I joined the university myself in 1987. Uh, the environment was very good. It, it, there was a very clear, you know, a balance between you know, political activity by students and uh, the normal day-to-day -day academic work of students. And if you want to get to political activity, when students were allowed to have a lot of political debates on campus. We used to have so many political associations here, and then from time to time, students would go out there, you know, protest, uh, very serious protests, and protests against one part state, for example, protest against corruption. Uh, then, one of the most prominent, that was before, a year before we came in, related to the death of President uh, Samara Marshall in Mozambique, uh, the students here at the University of Zimbabwe took the lead in uh, you know, dealing with uh, what was then thought to be the main reason for that uh, apartheid South Africa and so forth. So I would say that it was a very active political community by students. At the same time, it was conducive to academic work. All right, I picked the North where student had an avenue to protest maybe uh, against the corruption and the status quo in terms of national politics. Uh, my question is now, Commenting on national politics on the side of ZANU-PF, one can be termed as pro-MDC and other way around you can be referred to as a pro-ZANU-PF. And now international politics, taking a look on student activism, what's your take in terms of uh, the development and the evolution? Well, I think now it's quite, uh, there is a, a big difference from that uh, perspective of uh, students uh, being either one part or the other. I think what I have discovered interacting with students seeing it, there is now a, some appreciation of the fact that there is more to our politics than the two big political parties. And that is the notion that we believe ought to be promoted. That uh, we are a multi-party democracy and that even uh, among students we have seen the growth of so many other organizations that are not aligned uh, to any of the two political parties. And we expect that that should be the position that ought to be taken. There is more to Zimbabwe than two political parties. Uh, all right. Uh, in terms of education, going through your CV, after University of Zimbabwe, you felt that your league of studies abroad, and now you are a decorated professor at the University of Zimbabwe, where the same thing can now be done, where you are the mentor. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, the academic evolution, do you think that ad academic revolution, evolution in our nation is bearing such fruitful results? Yeah, I, I very much think so. I think, of course, there are restraints. The only constraints we have are resources. But uh, we are very brilliant students here, and we also have very good lecturers in the University of Zimbabwe. Uh, the opportunities we got ourselves of going abroad were necessary at that time because there was not enough uh, framework for you to do it within the country. We didn't have many professors uh, at my level now. Uh, we also didn't have many resources within the university frameworks. And so you couldn't have enough people to uh, promote, encourage students. But now I think there is, there is scope for that. Uh, we, we, we meet very good students and they are doing very well. We should be able to, to produce students with the results that we need. Uh, well, I picked something, but uh, despite uh, the limitations of resources, what do you think can be done for us to get where we want to get as a nation in terms of our educational system? Well, I think what has to be done now is to try and keep improving our curriculum. Uh, that's the main focus. Our curriculum which would expose students to the kind of things that uh, would quickly develop their intellectual potential and their capacity to, to develop. I think that's what. So we are already doing that. I think Education 5.0 here and what the University of Zimbabwe has been doing, so many new courses have come up and we have created sufficient scope for students to do that.
All right, Professor. I was going through the constitutional history of Zimbabwe, where for a moment back there, it is believed in 1999 you were part and parcel of the drafting of the MDC constitution, and you went on to be a member of a well-known political party at the National Constitutional Assembly. And most of your activities have been uh, fighting constitutionalism and uh, constitutionality in Zimbabwe, including also denying the proposed law through the year 2000 at the re uh, through referendum. And even to that, uh, you are undeniably the only person who have won more legal battles uh, for the MDC. Now my question, what is the relationship between politics and law in Zimbabwe? Well, I mean, it's a very difficult question that you are posing. The relationship between law and politics is not an easy one to, to say. But what I can say is that uh, clearly the political framework has to be within the legal way. You have to do it within the law. So that would be the relationship between law and politics. But I'm not sure whether you are saying whether lawyers are, are more likely to be politicians. In other words, uh, is there a relationship between being a lawyer and then also being politicians? Here we, need, we, we find that many of our lawyers uh, are very active politicians as well. I think that comes from the way law is taught here. And uh, I mean, the keen focus on wanting to see justice done, wanting to see fair play, and as long as our political system is dominated like it is at the moment, by unfairness, by injustice, by you know, people trying to use the law to gain some political advantage here against uh, colleagues, you will find that lawyers and law will continue to be useful in that regard. Uh, I don't know if I got it wrong in terms of how lawyers are being groomed at the University of Zimbabwe. We're now getting into practicing law. How are uh, students are equipped in terms of now separating law uh, their profession uh, despite of their p political affiliations and backgrounds because being maybe a, a member of the MDC and I'm representing a, a particular person from ZANU-PF in terms to, to a mere person who doesn't understand the mechanism of our legal system what uh, maybe words can you give an advice to them? Well that advice is to be given to members of the public not to the lawyers, I think the lawyers are very clear the way we train them, they know that it has nothing to do, you don't choose clients on the basis of your political affiliation, or you don't choose clients on the basis of race, say if I'm white, I want, I, I want to represent white people, and so on. So the issue will still arise, to say this is a white lawyer, why are they representing a black person, this is a black lawyer, why are they representing So that is totally out. It is for the public to appreciate that the role of a lawyer is not to push the politics of a client or the philosophy of a client. The role of a lawyer is to assist a client get what the law says that client is entitled to. That's oh. what it is, yeah. Oh, oh, all right, fantastic. But still on the same page, Professor, you have uh, on many occasions made headlines of a certain constitutional realities that we can all relate, relate and reflect on. And so, uh, we want to take us on a journey where we are going to take some of the issues on academic and impartial enlightenment to both students and maybe uh, Zimbabwe at large, starting with the 2018 elections contestations. And for a while, even after the Concord ruling, some even uh, when saying uh, President Emerson Munangagwa, he is an illegitimate president, and also some of the political parties, which I may not mention. What's your comment on that? Yeah, well, that's, that's a, a very important question you're posing. Look, I think that uh, it, you indicated earlier on the relationship between law and politics mm -hmm. and so forth. And I want to make that very clear. It is possible that um, some people from their political framework would want politics to drive the law. In other words, you, your political belief mm -hmm. must prevail all the time. So if you do not like uh, President Mnangagwa as a president or as a winner, you make it politically. But the law does define the circumstances in which a person is said to have won an election. And then the law also specifies the circumstances in which a political dispute is resolved, if you involve the court. Mm -hmm. uh, when, so our constitution is very clear, in section 93 of our constitution says that whenever an election has taken place, 
and there are people that are candidates, they are not happy with the result that has been announced by the authorities who are running the election. You go to only one court and that court is called the Constitutional Court. You present your issue there and then that court will determine. But if that court determines, rightly or wrongly, that this is the particular position, then that position binds the country legally. Uh, and then if it binds the country legally, it must also bind the country politically. Now, there are people who don't agree with that. They think that there is a legal uh, issue and a legal battle which is determined legally. And then there's something called politics which remains undefined. In other words, if you believe you have won an election and you go to a court and the court says you have not won, as far as we are concerned, at law, mm -hmm. you will say, well, I don't care what the court says. I have won. So you continue in this world of politics where there is no arbiter. You continue to say, I've won the election. And when you do that, you are doing it not because you don't know that legally you have not won, but you are trying to prepare your political future. You have supporters who believe that uh, you will never lose. And you must carry those supporters with you to the next election. Because if you somewhat have your policy which believes that if I say I have lost, they may not vote for me again mm -hmm. next time. So I must remain invincible. That has always been the politics of uh, some of our political parties here. I, when we formed the MDC, and the reason why I left the MDC myself to now be a member of the party that we lead the NCA, it was really because of difference of that nature. I believe that... Um, you can fight legally, you fight lo uh, also politically. But at some point, you have to give the law uh, prevalence. The law must prevail for order in society. And I think that comes not just from my training as a lawyer. It also comes from my belief that orderly society can only arise if we apply the law. That's what I believe, and I, I, I think you can if you want to. Yeah, but on the same note, can we say, uh, speaking from a professor in the legal field point of view, can we say there is a clear, clear line between our politics and law, and from the legal profession, can you say there is one, two, three that can be done for us to enjoy the legal system as it is and as it not ought to be? Okay, thank you. You see... The debate would be wrong if we even want to make you know law play a role in all this field. Law is one thing, other things are other things. So law is there to try and create an orderly society, knowing very well that people belong to different religions, they belong to different political persuasions, they belong to different races, and so forth. Now let's let me take the typical example because this is a a channel that is, um, you know, followed by students and those that want to grow into. Let's take a very clear example mm -hmm. of a person who believes that their race is superior. All right. Let's use that example. So you are white and you believe you, you are superior. The law says you are not superior. There is no superior race. So when we live in a world of law, there is no superior race. All right. But if you decide to live in your world, I mean, in your own small home, in your own small space, with your own children, you teach your children that I'm superior, you can do that wherever you are. But when we come to organize society, we are in a public platform, we are in a country, we won't accept that nonsense of your superior. Mm -hmm. We say we are governed by law. Let me now quickly go to politics. Oh, all right, that's fine. So with politics, if we believe that we have a way in which we determine who is president, we vote, and there are electoral disputes, we go to a court that we have created. If that court says, this is the position, then in the world where we live, which is our order world, we go with that result. But you are not stopped in your own small corners telling your supporters, telling your friends and others that, no, I won. But you can't then make that uh, part of the public domain and say everyone must agree that you want. That's where you... So always remember my example. Someone believes I'm a, I'm a superioress and then they want all of us to believe that they are superior because they... And they say, no, disregard the law. The law is not... 
And so on. That, I think that would be wrong. All right. I was having a fascinating conversation with one of our producers where uh, regarding Vice President Mohadi's resignation, where your legal opinion sparked uh, a legal debate on Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, where your friends like Alex Magaisa came through, and the headlines were from the Zimbabwean professor Maduku Vankishis, Dr. Magaisa, a friend in brutal legal fight. Take us out on that note. Well, I, thought, I think the headline was very misleading because that is not what was at stake. Oh, yeah. Yeah, what was at stake, you know, you know, different opinions as to what uh, that resignation meant and what was required. You will recall, I think people must remember, when Vice President Mohadi resigned, uh, some people came up and said that Section 96, I think, of the Constitution compelled President Mnangagwa to inform the nation within 24 hours oh, yeah. of the resignation. And the point that I was making was that there was no such compulsion in the Constitution because Vice President Mohadi had not been an elected Vice President. The Constitution, uh, that, then at that time, it is now has been amended, did provide that at some point in future, after 2020, in 2023 onwards, we will also be electing Vice President as running men. So that provision which said the President would inform the nation within 24 hours, as far as I know, and in fact, I think that is the correct position, that provision will only trick in if the vice president is an elected vice president. But where the constitution says that a vice president is hired and fired by the president, I think logically it didn't make any sense for you to compel the president to inform the, the nation and so on. That's where they debated. In fact, uh, um, uh, Dr. Magaisa and many of his uh, colleagues who were of the other opinion had clearly missed uh, directed themselves, and I'm sure they accept it now, well, uh, that they had not read the Constitution with what I then said in an inner legal eye. I think that's the term that came out to be proper. What I meant by that is that, uh, because it takes four years for you to be a lawyer, for example, mm -hmm. and then it, of course, takes several other years for you to be well grounded in the law. The law is not just being able to read the English language, because the Constitution is written in, in, written in the English language, and if you can read it, then you say, I know. That is what I, the point I was making, and I think all my colleagues appreciate that from time to time you bring in some, what I, I would still insist is called in an inner legal eye, which is you're looking at legal provisions in a context of the law as a whole. Mm -hmm. You look at the law as a totality, and when you do that, that is what will take uh, an expert from a non-expert, and so on, things like that. Uh, all right, Professor. Uh, on the issue of uh, the reappointment of uh, uh, Chief Justice uh, Malaba, what's your comment on that? Uh, well, I think it's now clear. He was reappointed. You know, it's not even the term to use. He is a Chief Justice at the moment by virtue of the amendment to the Constitution. All right. So in terms of amendment number two, which still has not been challenged, uh, so once the amendment passed through Parliament and then became law on 7 May, the Chief Justice Malaba then, on 7 May, was still below 70 years. And so what that constitution said is that if you are reaching 70 and you would want to remain in office as Chief Justice, you all you need to do is to elect to remain in office, provided you satisfy the President that uh, your medical condition oh, wow. is such that you'll be able to. And so Chief Justice Malaba did that. He elected to remain in office, and then he served the president with the relevant papers. The president approved. In other words, he's required to accept, say, I have seen the papers, I approve that these are correct legal, uh, medical records. So he, strictly speaking, was not reappointed. Okay. He elected to continue in office, and his election to continue in office was supported by medical documents that were approved by the president. The president does not approve the election he satisfies himself that the documents are showing that the Chief Justice or a judge elected to remain in office is in, in proper medical condition. Oh, okay. But the continuation office was granted by the Constitution. Well, thank you for that enlightenment. But oh, despite the conversations and the narratives that are being made uh, on Twitter and uh, our social medias regarding uh, the donations of cars to Pollard members, Professor, you are part of a political actors dialogue known as Pollard. 
Uh, may you briefly explain to us what it is all about, its legal backing, its significance, and what it seeks to achieve in our land? Okay, thank you. I think first uh, there are several things coming out and they are very important things. First, what is Pollard all about? Pollard is all about entrenching a democracy. That's what Pollard is all about. A democracy is about entertaining various and divergent views. A democracy operates from the premise that no two individuals are the same. You share different views from my views, but we belong to one political entity. So in that political entity, when we want that entity to move, we exchange ideas. And one of the elements is that uh, many people would want to lead this country, either as MPs or councillors or presidents. And the, our constitution says you determine who runs the country on the basis of an election. But as soon as an election has taken place, the person who would have won the election has a term, five years in the case of the president. He is not supposed to run the country purely and exclusively on his own ideas. He is allowed by our system to engage those that seem to be also interested in politics and say, can we from time to time exchange views? Can we from time to time you know, hear from you at a closer range what you think? And I am doing so, as I am speaking on behalf of the winner, I'm doing so because we were in a race together. You also wanted to be president, <laughs> but you failed because you didn't win. Mm -hmm. So you are losers. I am the winner. But as a winner, I would want to work with, with losers. So Pollard is a platform where the winner interacts with the losers during the five-year term to get ideas where possible, to get criticisms where possible within that close range. And that's what would happen. So he would, in the, in the Polar Twitter, it's called political actors dialogue. The word dialogue there simply means interaction. Okay. That's what it means. But I think because we use the word dialogue, there, there are people who thought that um, a dialogue is a process where you discuss power sharing, where you discuss you know, things like that, where do you discuss political disputes. It's not that. Political disputes are dealt with. It elsewhere. If you have a dispute, you go to a court and so on, or you do it else. But in this interaction, it's actually to be discussing issues to move the country forward. Or, or That's what Pollard is. But I, I, like you mentioned, the word loser, but I would love to use the word uh, the people aspiring president who couldn't have the chance to be uh, leading this nation. Uh, from the dialogue, from the conversations you are making in the House, is there room for implementations of such conversations or maybe it's just a, a, a picture that is being portrayed to the nation at large? There is a lot of room for implementation. What is lacking at the moment is actually to you know, publicize out there polar meetings, polar discussions, polar recommendations, and then follow them through and say, this recommendation was made, it was implemented here. And there I blame the government for, you know, not going forward. The moment they all accept, I think coming from what the public has been keeping on saying, the moment they accept that they need to tell the public what it is that has been discussed and what it is that has been taken, what it is that has not been taken, then people begin to appreciate. So let's be clear there that uh, not everything said in Poland is accepted by government. Then not everything say I mean not everything said in Poland is rejected. In other words, so there are certain things that are actually accepted. And I, I can give you examples that uh, let's take the current pandemic and so forth. In Poland meetings, and I remember the first meeting when we were discussing the lockdown issues and so forth. The push to get a lockdown, you know that first hard, hard lockdown that mm -hmm. came in. It was a Pollard discussion. One of our medical uh, persons in Poland was the leader of the political parties, Dr. Dan. I remember him actually telling the president what it would take to get us out of uh, you know, the, the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so we had that meeting and so forth. So I would not say that the, the president already had ideas on you know, uh, having a lockdown. And then you have that massive exchange in how you go about it get the issue to do with the vaccination. 
it is not an accident that uh, Poland leaders were vaccinated long back in March, March uh, 2021. You got Poland leaders vaccinated. I couldn't myself go to um, Vic Falls because I had a funeral. But the moment I came back from the funeral, I went for my own vaccination, not through the Poland. The, the people went with the president from Twitter Falls and they went to the second jab in Kwekwe. Because I had a different program, I then followed my own. But as we speak now, all Poland leaders were vaccinated long back in, so by beginning of May, we all had our second jabs. What does that take? It was a decision that um, let's lead from the front. Let's say, you know, and then the political parties were not in Poland. Up to now, I have not seen a photo of Chamisa uh, getting a job. I have not seen a photo of Tendai having a job. Nothing. I have seen some pictures, I think now, Wendy and others. I mean, this is it. These are latecomers. These are people who were actually, you know, first, not coming out to encourage vaccination. Secondly, we have not seen them vaccinated. The, the point I'm making is very clear. Uh, Poland is not just a, a useless talk shop, as you might. There are so many decisions. So I've, I've given to do with the pandemic. There was a, a, a Poland economic summit that took place, I think, sometime um, yeah, last year. We came up with uh, recommendations. It took place, was launched there. And many of the recommendations that came up, some, of, some of already the Ministry of Finance and the Reserve Bank already had their own ideas. But they were strengthened a lot with um, measures that were coming from there. And the chairperson of our committee called Trust Kovora was, uh, I mean, in forefront in our meetings, presenting a document showing what. Then I come to a committee that I lead in Poland, which has to do with, it's called Governance Legislative Agenda. We've made, we lost out on the constitution. Poland had pushed for a situation where we would not push the amendment number two. We failed on that. I am, I'm, I'm thinking I'm on record criticizing amendment number two. Even people getting confused that I say this is completely unacceptable, the person who made number two, etc. But then when I went to represent my client called Max Mpung, who then uh, was actually pushing for the Chief Justice position to be clear, they thought I was contradicting myself. That's the earlier point we made in our discussions exactly. and so forth. But that's a different matter. In answering you, I would say that the weakness of Poland is not publicizing its positions. But Poland knows its place. It's a platform to exchange ideas. It is not the government. The government takes 90% of all the decisions that are affecting the country. And I think that about 10% of those would be decisions influenced by Poland. And I'm sure there are also decisions influenced by others. Uh, because this is a platform of young people. Let me explain that... Um, you know, governance and ideas that run this country, they are not monopolized by the government of the day. Okay. So even you yourself, Victor, as an individual, you have a very brilliant idea. You can throw it to the president. I mean, now we have Twitter, you have emails, you have... You can even write your own letter and say, I am Victor, I'm my law student, now in my finishing my first year and so forth. But Mr. President, I have this idea. I am a Zimbabwean. And you make that go to... That's the country we want to produce. And uh, thinking from what you said, I have used the word losers. You said those people that uh, couldn't make it, which is perhaps a more polite way of putting it across. <laughs> but this country does not belong to its winners, in, uh, or we win an election. This country does not belong to the big political parties. This country belongs to everyone. And I know that some people say, you have small political parties and so on. Parties don't remain small. They were small in 2018, but they may become bigger. But it's not about the size of a political party. It is the size of the ideas that you put on the table. That's what politics is all about. Yeah, uh, taking us back on social media where we saw uh, a vigorous comments coming through, where Pollard uh, participants were being uh, given cars. Mm -hmm. And I think the whole nation, especially young people, that was the point, they realized, oh, there is something polar that is existing where now polar participants are not given cars. A polar to young people uh, in Zimbabwe. What uh, is 
what are its significance to people, to young people in Zimbabwe? Yes, thank you. I will explain that and also, of course, come to the fair because I you have a separate question. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I think to young people, Pollard represents the importance of harnessing all the ideas that we have for development purposes. And that's the best way of putting it. It is to build a culture where this country must benefit from all its talents, where this country must benefit from all the ideas that are around. And for young people, that is the way to go. From 1980 up to actually recently, this country was losing a lot from the fact that you would have a Zanu PF government that would make this mistake, that mistake. It never asks anyone, it never consults anyone. It, it will make mistake after mistake. All ideas have to come from one port, which is the port of those that have chosen to support that party, the port of those that have chosen to be in that party. Okay. That is wrong. In the same way that I believe that by 2023, young people must look broader than just saying there's an APF there, there's that MDC, there's that. No. They must realize that there's a lot of talent in So Pollard represents a culture where ideas would be able to develop what young people aspire. In other words, to me, as far as I see Pollard, it is saying, even when you are not in the winning party, even when you are not in politics uh, directly, your ideas and your thoughts can be put on the political table. Okay. That's what it means. And that we cannot survive unless we do that. Every other country has done that. They have not done it through a pollard of nature. They have mechanisms where ideas keep being channeled to those who, for the time being, are in charge of the affairs of the state. Okay. I hope I'm making that point clear. They have a formula which ensures that somewhere down there is, I mean, if you go by social media, why would people not want Professor Maduka's ideas to be somewhat reach the president? I have very good ideas and so forth. And I should not throw away those ideas because someone didn't vote for me in 2018 or they will not vote for me in 2023. Fine. I mean, like I teach you in the classes and so forth, it would have been, I mean, if you go by the logic, I'm sure I should not even qualify to teach a law because somewhat my politics is not, you know, uh, acceptable to some people. Exactly. I think we must harness talent and that our young people who are growing now we must ensure that we use them fully. Okay. And Pollard is a good culture. Then I come to the issue about the vehicles. I think I should quickly tell you that it's because, again, of the discourse. What we were given were not vehicles. We were given the right to use the vehicles. <laughs> we were not given vehicles. Those vehicles belong to the state. Right. I'm sure you saw one parked outside my office. Yeah, They belong to the state and they are government vehicles. The president made it clear, I think it was also public, that they can only belong to the political parties after three years. Okay. So in this three-year period, we are uh, allowed to use government vehicles for w the work of Poland. So when we go to give these ideas, when we go out to and so on, and because we are giving ideas and we, are, we also have to have surviving parties, our parties must be alive. So we can use those vehicles to do our work. In other words, I should not say now, you see, I've seen the vehicles, and I think it's good that we're doing it in your program. When I came and driving to this place, I was not coming for Pollard work or for NCA work. I was actually coming for my work that you saw me doing in this office. Mm -hmm. But I should not change cars. If I'm driving now to get to the work to the university, soon when we finish this interview, I'll be driving to the NCA office to do some work. And so, and if there's, so there is just have that flexibility. Okay. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that. All right, Professor, talking of uh, national development at large, uh, we are talking of the Vision 2030 and having the 2023 election ahead of us. What is the participation of uh, Pollard in terms of harnessing the Vision 2030 or it's uh, the current uh, government's agenda? Well, I mean, I think it's not... Uh, well. It can, it's always wrong to say that a particular agenda is a government agenda. Uh, I'm saying that because at any one point you have a government. Mm -hmm. And so certain agendas are obviously coming by virtue of what the government is doing. Let's take not just 2030, take the land reform process. Mm -hmm. 
we made a mistake in the opposition ourselves in 1999. Okay. We were very much against land reform. We characterized land reform as a ZANOPF program. Okay. And then we encouraged our supporters not to participate in the land reform program. And what ended up happening was that, you know, many people did not take farms. But now, go around the country, in the opposition, all our supporters, all our members, now realize that we made a mistake. It's because we characterize that program as a Zanopia program. Okay. So 2030, uh, our vision 2030, although coined by President Mnangagwa and his government, because they were the government of the day, of the day at that point, I think it should be regarded as a, as a, as a Zimbabwean agenda. agenda. Okay. And Poland has been doing a lot. We participated in the coining of the current strategy, national development uh, strategy and so forth. We, are, we were part of that and we are still part of implementing now. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the enlightening uh, uh, conversations. But just to round up, uh, Professor, I, on a light note, I'm sure you also have come across uh, uh, the famous clip in which the late president uh, mocks you uh, as a cunning political activist at the Maduku strategy. Mm -hmm. What's your reaction on that? Well, I, 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 I'm very humbled by it and very <laughs> proud of it in the sense that... Uh, uh, I'm proud of it. This is coming from a statesman of not uh, President Mugabe. So mm -hmm. if you are a leader of a group and then the country gets to the attention of the president, and that anyone who analyzes that thing sees that the president is not mocking him. He was clearly expressing uh, first frustration at the fact that these people were not ending their quest for a constitution. He, he said he was very much opposed to the idea of a new constitution. Oh, right. And so his attack, which he called the Maduro strategy, was his own political strategy of trying to undermine the constitutional reform agenda. Oh, right. So that, to me, was a, it's, it's a moment showing that we were very effective at the time. But there are people who have taken it uh, completely missed the point that was coming in. Everyone knew at the time it was made that it was, it was not true. It, I, at the time it was happening, I was a full-fledged academic here, teaching in the university. At the time it was sufficient. University salaries were quite sufficient. The president even knew that apart from my work as an academic, I was also a you know, well, well-paid consultant. And he was aware of that. But he was simply trying to find a political way Okay. of undermining the constitutional reform process. But he failed because we ended up with some constitution, although we didn't like the constitution. But the struggle for a new constitution did not end. I, By the time President Mugabe um, died, I had excellent relations with him. And that uh, that uh, video must remain permanently <laughs> a part of my political uh, framework. And so forth. Uh, fantastic. Professor, uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, your sacrifice to be on this show but uh, before we close what are your words of advice for our viewers as takeaways uh, I think that if your viewers are young people the takeaway is important this country belongs to everyone in this country and I would be quite disappointed if young people were to fail to think on their feet to fail to have a broad mind and were to play what we are trying to take away and remove partisanship in the development of the country. I don't want to see our young people, and I would not like to continue to see them doing that, being consumed by partisan politics. I am this party, I'm that party. That is totally irrelevant. I am a Zimbabwean. I have this idea. I can engage that idea. I think it doesn't make sense. You only become this part or that part when on that very small day you go into the ballot to vote for a part of your choice. Once you have done that, you have done it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Outside the ballot box, you must be a full-fledged independent Zimbabwean wanting to contribute to the development of this country. If you go to the ballot box, you vote for someone else, and then the other person you didn't vote for is making some good point. Just say you accept, you, you think that point makes sense and you support it. Because that won't affect your vote next time. You can still continue to vote for a person of your choice. But what we, I would want to encourage young people to do, they must get out of these pigeonholes. 
I'm not. I'm not saying that they are there. Many of them. I think many. I, I. I told you at the beginning that I'm very impressed by what is growing in the young population now. That uh, we we want to see in four or five years here a society where the politicians are irrelevant outside the day of the election. Okay. You get that point. Outside the day of the election, the, I'm not supposed to be I'm this and, and that and so on. I think that also you should refer to the Bible sometimes. <laughs> there is some book there where I think it's Paul who went to some place. I think it's Galatians and so on. I'm not sure that is where these guys will say, I'm for Paul, I'm for so and so. They will, they will just give themselves to, to individuals. And they were told, I think in that book, that please, you pray to God. Don't give yourselves. So you pray to Zimbabwe. You are a Zimbabwean. Contribute to the growth of the country. Vote for a person of your choice, but don't make your political choice on voting day to determine your life outside them. That's the point I'm making. Uh, Professor, words are not enough to appreciate your time, but I thank you for being part of the conversation. Okay, thank you very much. I also find it very useful that uh, you have such a, a program. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, Zimbabwe, this is the Enlightenment series where we go beyond sensations, we go beyond tweets, we go beyond social media comments and face reality as it is. My name is Victor Marambi. Go and subscribe on our YouTube account, Campus Life TV. And from the crew behind the scenes, I'm Vicky the B. I'm out.